While Group B Rally is still remembered fondly by racing enthusiasts for its wild cars and daring drivers, Group 5 Special Production was the road-going precursor and was equally as thrilling. The cars in this class were nothing short of spectacular, a perfect blend of power, speed and ingenuity. And that is where today's story takes place. The story of the Zack Speed Capri, a car that dared to challenge the mighty Porsche 935 in the late 1970s and early 1980s. Group 5, also known as Special Production, was introduced in 1976, allowing significant modifications to production cars. Created to replace prototype cars which were declining in popularity, the rules and regulations around the development of these production cars were loose at best and widely open to interpretation. Teams could start with any car that had previously been homologated for groups 1 to 4, and there were no limitations on production numbers as long as at least 400 of the road-going version of the cars rolled off the production line. The original shape of the bodywork needed to be retained, but aerodynamic devices and alterations were allowed and thus began an explosion of creativity from engineers. Huge fenders and enormous wings made for radical looking cars that barely resembled their road going counterparts. But what made the Group 5 machine so unbelievable was what was hidden underneath all the excessive bodywork. The rulebook didn't enforce power limits, but merely a minimum weight requirement based on engine displacement and that the cars maintain their original engine blocks. This led to the rapid development of turbo systems which dramatically boosted performance and in effect saw these cars with a power to weight ratio comparable to F1 cars of the time. This era gave birth to some of the most iconic racing machines. Among these, the Porsche 935 stood out as the dominant force. With its turbocharged engine, aerodynamic enhancements and innovative engineering, the 935 was almost unbeatable. Aptly named Moby Dick, it dominated the World Championship for makes and the prestigious 24 Hours of Le Mans, cementing its reputation as the king of Group 5. Enter the Ford Motor Company, a name synonymous with American automotive excellence. Ford had a rich racing legacy but faced a daunting challenge, to dethrone Porsche from its dominant position in Group 5 racing. Ford's weapon of choice? The Zack Speed Capri, a car that would become legend in its own right. The Zack Speed Capri was born out of a collaboration between Ford and Zack Speed, a German racing team founded by Eric Zakowski. Based on the Ford Capri road car, the Zack Speed Capri was a marvel of innovation. It featured a lightweight aerodynamic body designed to maximize speed and agility. The derivative of the car that competed in Division 1 class packed a turbocharged 1.7 litre inline four engine that could produce up to 600 horsepower. Quite the punch for such a small engine. This powerhouse of an engine combined with the advanced aerodynamics and lightweight space frame chassis allowed the Zack Speed Capri to achieve blistering speeds and exceptional handling. The battle lines were drawn and the Deutsch Rennsport Meisterschaft of the DRM series would be the battleground where the fight would take place. An unusual format would see separate races at each event for Division 1 and Division 2 cars. Division 1 was defined as the big cars with two to four litre engines allowed and was also the place where the Porsche 935 was dominating. Division 2 was for up to two litre cars, but the unique format meant that the outright honours at the end of the season could be won by either a Division 1 or 2 car, depending on who scored more points throughout the season. The Zack Speed Capri was unleashed in the middle of the 1978 season in Division 2 configuration where it took a miraculous pole position in its first ever outing after just one day of testing. However, reliability plagued the early performance of the car, which only lasted five laps in the race. One lap speed was there and the car took three more pole positions before finally breaking through for victory at the season ending race at the Nürburgring. In 1979, Hans Heyer was able to put in a strong enough season to win the Division 2 title, but outright honours against the Division 1 Porsche 935 driven by Klaus Ludwig still eluded the Ford team. In 1980, Zack Speed upped their game and the 1.7 litre Division 1 Porsche killer was unveiled. Additionally, the previous year's champion, Ludwig, was recruited to wield the 600 horsepower weapon in an all-in attack on the outright championship. The Capri performed well, but the rear wing on the car was protested and all points from the first two rounds of the season were lost, leaving the team once again disappointed. Ironically, the outgoing Hans Heyer, now aboard a Division 2 Lancia Beta, was able to win the outright championship while the Capri and the 935 battled in Division 1. The 1981 season was where the Zack Speed Capri truly shone with both Division 1 and Division 2 cars now ready for battle. Klaus Ludwig moved back to Division 2 aboard the 1.4 litre car and Madfred Wickelhop was behind the wheel of the 1.7 litre Division 1 monster. 
Throughout the year, the Capri took the fight to the Porsche in spectacular fashion. Winklehock was competitive in Division 1 and managed to snag six wins, including the last four of the year, which took a large number of the available points away from the Porsche 935, driven by Bob Wallet. Meanwhile, Ludwig's skill and the Capri's performance culminated in a season to remember in Division 2, clinching 11 wins from 13 starts and wrapping up the outright title. Despite the excitement and innovation, the Group 5 era came to an end in 1982, which was also the year that marked the beginning of Group B Rally. Regulations changed and the racing world moved on, but the legacy of these incredible machines lived on. The Zack Speed Capri's triumph over the Porsche 935 remains a highlight of this golden age of racing, a time when creativity and engineering brilliance pushed the boundaries of what was possible. So, in today's video we're heading back to 1981 for round 3 of the season at the Hockenheim Ring aboard Manfred Winkelhock's Division 1 Zack Speed Capri. Okay guys, we're on the grid here, pole position. <laughs> oh, we're away, but very slowly. Welcome to Hockenheim. Round number three of the 1981 German Touring Car Championship, essentially is what it is. And we are aboard Manfred Winkelhock's Division 1 Zack Speed Capri. And what we're trying to do in this race is rewrite a little bit of history because as I already talked about 1981, Klaus Ludwig went on to win the championship in the Division 2 Zack Speed Capri because this car spent a lot of the championship fighting with Bob Wellock and ultimately came up just five points short of winning the Division 1 championship. Of course, because they fought each other so much. They could not get enough points to win outright, but the Division 1 honours went the way of Porsche and five points is nothing. And in this race in 1981, Manfred Winklehock started on pole like we have done here but failed to win the race. He finished third. Jochen Mass actually went through to win the race and Bob Wallock finished in P2 but that was five points advantage to Wallock in that race and that was the winning margin in the end. So if we can beat him in this race, we turn the tables. If we do tie on points at five uh, if we do manage to get the five points back and tie, we do have more wins on the season and win the last round of the championship. So in any form of count back, we would win a tiebreaker. So what we're trying to do here is just win this one or at least finish ahead of Bob Wallach and his Porsche 935 to try and get ourselves outright honours for the entire championship with Klaus Ludwig. But also... Division 1 honours here with this car, Manfred Winklehock's car. Such a strange format to grasp where there's two separate divisions racing separate races. You'd have a Division 1 race and then a Division 2 race on the same day. And uh, the most championship points scored across the year in your division would determine the overall championship results at the end of the year. Such an unusual format. We're taking it very easy here because we've got some rain about, as you can see. This race in 1981 started out like this. Changeable conditions, it was wet and it dried out as the race went on. And we've got a great start here, but you guys can't see my mirrors and we have got Volkert Moyle and Bob Wallach right behind us. Both in Porsche 935s. So we cannot really afford to take it easy. Those things are unbelievable in a straight line as well, which as you can see is a large majority of this lap. We've probably got an advantage in the corners, but at the moment, in tricky conditions, so I'm not really sure if it's going to be wet when we get to the corners or if it's going to stay 
dry, which at the minute it's sort of raining, but not wet enough to get the ground too wet. I think it looks worse than it actually is. Lots of water on the windscreen here, though. As I say that, I might have jinxed myself. That didn't feel too bad. We got on a white line and a curb there, and we still had grip, so... We're kind of the pioneer at the front. But they are behind me, just behind me. You might have caught a glimpse of them in the mirror there. But there are a wide range of cars in the race here. I've tried to reflect the grid as closely as I could, but what I have done is I have included both the Division 1 and 2 cars in the race together. So we've got 34 cars here as opposed to what would have been about 15 or 16, I think, in Division 1. So we should get some traffic as the race goes on with a few cars that are a little bit slower. Volk at Merle right up behind me. If they're close to me when we get to a straight, they'll drive straight past because they are that quick. We've got an advantage in the corners, but it's difficult. Straight across that chicane there. Now, I don't know that that chicane is particularly accurate for this year either. I don't know that this layout is exactly as it was in 1981. This is a later 1980s track mod here on Assetto Corsa, so this uh, may not be quite accurate, but it's about as close as I could get it for this track. But I will say the cars are unbelievable. Oh, a bit of wheel spin, and then didn't get a very good nice change up to third gear there. We're going to be under pressure down here. Is he going to be close enough? I'm going to let that go because I don't really want to be side by side through here. There he goes. That's Merle. Which is not the car that we need to beat. The car that we need to beat is the orange car that's just behind us. Now, of course, I couldn't get all the skins to be accurate for the drivers at the time, but this mod, the DRM Revival mod, which you can find if you Google it, or I'll put a link in the description below, is unbelievable. Probably one of the most well-polished and put-together mods I've ever seen. Of course, you pay for it. It is a paid mod. It's got a terrible run through turn one. But these cars are just electric to drive. They're so good so much sensation they're just beautiful and they sound and look incredible in fact it recently only had another update only earlier this year i think it's version 1.3.2 perhaps oh whoa, 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 we've locked a break now yeah, we're in trouble oh and more wheel spin there in the corner we might be going to lose this spot here the Porsche is quick in a straight line and it's coming. Uh, I think we're good. I might just dodge that one. Oh, listen to that. Just the backfiring. So we've got some traffic here already. There's a couple of the Division 2 cars that we're coming up on the back of. A little bit loose into there. Track's still not wet. But there are quite a few different cars in the mod, I should say as well. Division 1 and Division 2 configurations. As we are right... Oh, big brake log there to not run into the back of this car. That was really close. It's 
It's just getting in the way a little bit. Get out of the way. You wouldn't want to hit cars in these things in real life. I made it like Kevlar and stuff. They probably smash and disintegrate the second you hit anything. Very, very lightweight cars. In fact, the engineering from this period is just unbelievable. For example, this car, this exact car, the Zack Speed Capri, in this configuration with a 1.7 litre turbo motor putting out a roughly 600 horsepower, only weighed like 700 kilos. Kind of hard to believe. Obviously not built for safety, much like the Group B rally car era, which is what everyone remembers so well. Everyone remembers Group B Rally, but the parallels between Group B Rally and this are kind of amazing, really, once you start looking at it. You can see the lineage directly from these cars to Group B Rally. We pulled away from Mass and Wallach a little bit behind us now. They got a little bit held up with that traffic. just laughing at it. coming down there into the braking zone. The brakes are more of a suggestion than anything else, but at the time, oh, this had four disc brakes on it. Had rear disc brakes that came off the previous Ford that Zack Speed had worked with. Of course, it still pales in comparison to what we... Uh, spoiled with these days for technology but it was really interesting though just learning a little bit about how these cars were approached because the rule book for this class was oh literally only two and a half pages long it was seriously wide open for interpretation and like an engineer's dream, you'd never get that kind of freedom in anything these days, but... Some of the stuff they did in these cars was really quite impressive. Oh! Of course, they had to keep certain amounts of... the original cars. They were called shadow cars. Because... they were like a shadow of their original self, I guess. We got held up through all the corners and then left for dust on the straight here by this lap car. And we've got the Porsche, the Bob Wallach right back on our tail again as the rain gets much heavier down the back, well, sorry, down this straight here. Just gotta take it a little bit carefully under brakes just in case we've got low grip. But uh, this car, for example, the front of the car is just slammed down on the ground, like road clearance was not an issue. It had to maintain its windows and A, B and C pillars. But the front of the car has just dropped straight on the ground with a huge spoiler on the front. And the team at Zack Speed had the idea of Approaching this car almost like a open wheeler. And they had a floor that they basically just stuck to the bottom of the chassis, the original chassis of the Capri. And it was something like you'd only see in a monocoque type car, like an F1 car. And it created a huge amount of rigidity in the car, which obviously helps with handling, but. In addition to that, combined with that low front end, it, oh, get out of the way. It had uh, essentially the effect of making this a early ground effects car, which gave it supreme handling.
Of course, the space frame chassis and roll cage was another thing that they did in this car that was kind of brilliant. It weighed 70 odd kilos complete to keep everything super lightweight. Of course, they were not designed to be crashed like nothing was in those days. That was an afterthought. Safety was very much not the priority when building these types of cars. Which is the same thing we saw in Group B, which ultimately led to the end of this type of race car. When the safety just got out of hand, particularly in Rally. But it made for some really impressive cars. The engineering was not limited to this car though. The Porsche 935 was unbelievable car. I think my favorite part about that car was the way they approached the rule book with regards to the rear window where it had to maintain its original rear window, which it does. It exists and it's still there underneath the second rear window that they put over the back of it, which is laid down much flatter to facilitate that huge tail that they put on that car with all the aerodynamics and why it gets the nickname Moby Dick. When you look at it, you can see why. The rain is just starting to get worse and worse and worse. This race in 1981, like I said, started wet, but eventually dried somewhat. spin. We're looking in the mirror, we're about two and a half seconds in front of Bob Wallach at the minute, which is enough. Something like 10 seconds away from the race lead though, but we don't need to worry about that. That's not what we're trying to win here. We just range up here and pass. It looks like it's one of the baiters, the Lancia baiters. Which were also a very, very cool looking car. Like I mentioned at the top of the video, it went on to win the 1980 championship in group, or sorry, division two. Everything about these cars is just so manual. <laughs> Aside from the fact that it's got a H pattern shifter, which I just feel like should be mandatory in a race car. If you want a race car, it has to have a H pattern shifter. It just should be a rule. Of course, we're going a long way away from that in today's day and age, and I'm just old fashioned, but it's absolutely the way that a car should be driven fast. There's a certain technique and authenticity about driving a H-pattern manual car. As I say that I completely missed the downshift coming into turn one, which is another thing about it. It makes it tricky. These cars are not easy to drive. In fact, the hardest part about them, apart from the braking, which is, like I've already mentioned, pretty difficult, is probably the, uh, the turbo lag and trying to manage that.
there is a significant turbo lag on these cars, which was something that was famous at the era because it was so new. Turbo technology at the time was still really new. I mean, turbo lag's a thing regardless, but these were the very first turbo cars to go racing, essentially. This is where the turbo race began in these cars. I mean, again, it was interesting you there, like, just slipping and getting huge turbo, but not getting the drive to go with it. But the, uh, that Group B rally car era, we're so used to seeing the huge turbos. Because this is Ludwig in front of us, our teammate in the Division 2 car. Pretty deep under brakes there, but we get that job done. Oh, huge wheel spin there. That was almost a crash. But yeah, the turbo is almost a suggestion until you wait, you know, a second or two, and then it just kicks off and you got all the power in the world, which is the sort of characteristics that the drivers talked about dealing with in this time. I think it was one of the drivers who raced in the... the Lancias, which is the car just in front of us up here. Uh, they described it like you couldn't go too hard under brakes into the corners because before you even got to the turn, you had to be on the throttle. So you had all the boost when you got to the corner exit. Like, the idea of driving full throttle into a turn is almost unfathomable. <laughs> Big lot of clouds coming over the track at the minute. Very overcast there, but the rain seems to have eased, so getting a little bit more comfortable as we go. We are still losing time to the leader, but we're now four and a half seconds up the road from Wallach behind, so... We're just past the halfway mark. We might be able to press on a little bit now and see if we can catch the leader. That was a bit wild in the dirt. Yeah, for sure the weather's looking a bit better. Just a huge overcast section over the back of the track, but we're gonna try and press on now and see if we can get a little bit more pace out of this and start to bridge the gap back to the leader. tires and everything are nicely up to temperature now as well. needed a, an upshift there. <laughs> it just glides through the corner and then the turbo kicks in and it just goes into oversteer. This is my favourite part of the lap down here into this braking zone. Fifth gear and the turbo and then the backfire when you lift off. Tried second gear through there that time and I don't think that was faster. God, that sound. Hang on to it.
Come up here and go cruising past the BMW. We have started matching and even gaining a little bit on the race leader now, so let's see if we can get him. fast into there we just keep it on the track in fact we've made a pretty big gain there on that lap just at the end of that lap that might be him just up there I think actually going through the traffic I think he got held up so now we've got someone in our vision that we can chase. The Volker Merle, I think, DNF this race. It was Jochen Mass who actually drove up and won. He currently sits P4 on the track. But you can see it was all the Ford Capri and a series of Porsche 935s that were the cars to beat. There were a bunch of BMWs on the grid in Division 1 in this race. Quite a few of them, actually. And they are in this race as well. I've got them in here, but we haven't seen hardly any of them. There he is, the red car up there. That's who we're chasing. He's still stuck in traffic. I'm not sure why, but I'm not complaining about it because it means that we're right on him. That heel and toe downshift, so satisfying. Of course, we wouldn't have had div class B traffic. Or Division 2, I should say, traffic to contend with in the real world. Look at that Capri. Must be our teammate again, who's obviously having a drama. He must have been in the pits. So we should not have caught him again. And that car's fast in a straight line. It's got the smoke coming out of it. So cool. Look at the gap that the leader's put on us again now that he's got a bit of clear air. Your teammate. Sorry about that.
I find something charming about the story. It's a bit of a David versus Goliath type story. The Porsche dominated. Ferrari dominated in the 60s at Le Mans. Ford just enjoyed coming out and spoiling the party. Coming over to Europe and... getting amongst it and causing some problems and ruffling some feathers and what a way to do it. For anyone who's not familiar, they should look up that 1960s Le Mans battle between Ferrari and Ford if you're not familiar about it and you've had your head under a rock because it's well documented at this point, but those Carroll Shelby GT40s were extremely cool cars. But then... Fast forward 10 years, and then this is the next thing that they decide they're gonna take racing in Europe. Of course, Zach Speed was already pretty well established for working with Ford products by the time this partnership really came about, but... What an absolute weapon of a car. A little bit deep under brakes there, get it stopped. Looks like, is that one of the BMWs up there getting lapped? Those BMWs were frighteningly quick in a straight line. There are a heap of them in this race, but none of them were able to hang with us at the start. That motor went on to become a Formula One motor. So we're right with the leader again. Oh! Oh, it was a bump. He's gone. That's not how you want to pass someone, but we'll take that. He stayed on the track. He's right behind us. He might not be happy with that. Oh, he sent it. It's going to stop. Wow, what a pass. Supreme braking there. Okay, so status quo. We'll go after him again. I might have lit a fire under him there. I got a pretty good run down the straight, and I didn't know that he'd catch me, but he did. And they just drive away on the straight. They're so fast. And I'll tell you who is moving at the minute is Bob Wallach and P3. He's caught us up by like six seconds in the last couple of laps. So we can't dawdle too much here. Get into him again. You would never do that with these cars in real life and get away with it. They would no doubt just crumple with even the faintest contact. Oh, big, 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 big oversteer moment right there.
Had to delay getting onto the throttle a little bit there. So I thought I was going to hit him in the mid corner and look what happened. They drove away off the corner now. Even with the draft, I'm not catching. I'm not catching. BMW is so quick in a straight line. I don't know that that was a BMW. Either way, ice forward. <laughs> Using all of the racetrack. Two laps to go. We're just quicker in all these twisty sections and then we hit the straights and they disappear. Look at it go, that thing. Trying to keep the foot in it and just control all the back of the car even though it's getting pounded with boost out of the turbo. Oh, We were fast through there but didn't get a good run off it. Are we close enough though through this stadium section at the end of the lap to maybe get a move done here? Sort of left a gap. Not quite, can't quite get up there. Oh, he made a mistake over the curb. He's run a little bit wide there. Oh, we got into him again. But not the first time at that spot. Just a little bit slower through that corner than us. Just a huge drift all the way into the main straight. One lap to go. Gave it absolutely everything through turn one. All I can say is this, guys. 
I hope you've enjoyed this video as much as I've enjoyed putting it together because this has been a lot of fun. If you want to see more like it, please let me know in the comments below. Of course, don't forget to like, subscribe, do all that stuff. It all helps. We are close, coming into the last part of the lap. Can we get this job done? Oh, we've missed the downshift. Oh. It's hard to slow the cars when you don't have that engine braking. Might be too far away, but either way, if we can just stay here, we would do enough here by beating Bob Wallach to draw the 1981 championship points for Division 1 Championship, but then win on a count back. So not only would the Zack Speed Capri would have won the championship outright, but it would have won both Division 1 and Division 2. So we're not going to be able to get this move done here. Not without running over him. Grandstand finish though. But thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you in the next one.